Dr. Kondapali, this is uh, the first time India has conferred the honor to, to a Japanese uh, leader, Japanese Prime Minister, making him uh, uh, the chief guest at uh, Republic Day celebrations. Uh, how do you look at this very important gesture? What does it signify? And um, to what extent is this forthcoming visit by Japanese Prime Minister a transformational visit? Well, in terms of the chief guest to uh, honored guest to the Republic Day Parade, uh, I think uh, it's a huge honor given to the uh, Japanese Prime Minister. And it came in the wake of uh, both sides suggesting to a 21st century global partnership mm -hmm. um, for either side. Uh, and uh, the 2 plus 2 dialogue process, in addition to the prime ministerial mm -hmm. summit level meetings, they right. also now have foreign ministry, defense right. ministry summit level meetings. Right. So all put together, there is, uh, uh, for the last 10 years roughly, there has been a two, two and fro movement mm -hmm. between the two establishments. Right. And I think this comes uh, at that level of uh, confidence uh, levels being high between mm -hmm. the two sides and, and the announcement about the Republic Day Parade chief guest position mm -hmm. given to the Prime Minister. Uh, so there is a huge baggage for this and uh, uh, it comes in this wake. Right. Um, but frankly, looking at the uh, last 64, 65 years uh, of uh, independence, right. we have had uh, visitors from different countries. Uh, uh, previously, uh, uh, we had the Kazakh president, the uh, Indonesian president, right. Nigerian president right. some time ago, the Bhutanese king mm. um, two, three years ago. So we have had uh, visits by several of our neighbors and mm -hmm. faraway countries. Right. Um, so we also should not sh see too much about the uh, guest of honor for the Republic Day right. uh, position because right, we right. have we, we have invited in the last six decades right. uh, nearly sixty uh, right, heads right. of states for this. Right. So uh, so uh, Prime Minister Abe comes in in those uh, in that lineup. Right, right. So I think um, we should not uh, overstate this mm -hmm. uh, Republic Day thing. Uh, and it, it happened in the sense that the Diet was meeting till Friday evening. And on Monday again, the Diet meets mm -hmm. the Japanese parliament. Uh, so in between, he has a two and a half day stint, which he can utilize for a visit mm -hmm. to a quick visit to India and uh, uh, joint declaration statement, whatever. and. Uh, a whole lot of other agreements could be signed between the two sides. Uh, last time when uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh visited Tokyo, uh, last uh, previous year he wanted to visit, it could not be held because there were elections within Japan mm -hmm. uh, in which the LDP had won two-thirds majority, mm -hmm. displacing the DPG, DPJ. Right. Now, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, has come now, or planning to come now, uh, despite the fact that India is also going through the electoral prospects. Uh, so possibly because the body language between Dr. Manmohan Singh and Prime Minister Abe, uh, since Mr. Abe visited India in 2007, uh, the body language between them is uh, relatively uh, more friendlier. And mm -hmm. I think probably he's, he's reciprocating the visit by uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh last year. At that point, yeah. At that point. Right. Uh, the last uh, last couple of years, especially last two three years, have seen uh, uh, renewed efforts uh, by both India and Japan uh, to to give more strategic uh, uh, heft to their relationship. Uh, now, talking about security and strategic dimension of the relationship, which will identified as a future area, how do you see it progressing? I think four areas are key to this strategic relationship, security relationship. One is uh, in terms of the economic and technological aspects. There is a huge um, emphasis by uh, the Indian side that uh, Japan could contribute to India's rise mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, FDI, mm -hmm. in terms of the manufacturing sector, upgradation mm -hmm. in the manufacturing sector. Number three, in terms of uh, the Indian services sector being promoted in Japan, including pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and IT software. Um, also a technological upgradation in the Indian. So there has been a huge uh, 
kind of uh, expectation from the Indian side that this will be number one major strategic uh, aspect when dealing with mm -hmm. Japan. Number two is in terms of the maritime domain. Mm -hmm. Both countries have uh, substantially improved their contacts in the maritime domain. This has been one of the aspects of strategic mm -hmm. dialogue. And uh, 13 Coast Guard uh, interactions have happened between the two sides, Japan as well as Indian Coast Guard. Uh, last one was actually last month, uh, the 13th one. Uh, and this is quite significant because they experimented with interoperability, which is a, uh, uh, which indicates that the relations are going uh, smoothly and at a very high level of interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, there is also the uh, uh, maritime self-defense forces and Indian Navy conducting mm -hmm. uh, intensive joint exercises uh, in the maritime domain. Two such uh, exercises have been conducted so far. It is again, uh, India does these exercises, the quality of such exercises with only United States, mm -hmm. UK, France and Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, so interoperability with Japan is a new uh, kind of uh, in, uh, inclusion okay. in the maritime domain. So the second aspect of strategic relations is the maritime aspect, which Dr. Manmohan Singh mentioned when, in his speech last year, mentioned about the two seas right. uh, mingling together in uh, in the Indian Ocean and the, the Pacific. Uh, uh, but Dr. Manmohan Singh also spoke about right, this, right, right. indicating that it is being legitimized right, now right, uh, in both India and Japan uh, discourse. Uh, so, maritime domain is the second major area of uh, attention. That's partly because Japan is heavily dependent on the Indian Ocean for its uh, roughly 75% of energy flows into, into Japan. Um, uh, and since the whole stretch is uh, problematic with piracy-related incidents, mm -hmm. Gulf of Aden, Somalia coast, mm -hmm. the South China Sea, Strait of Malaccas, across the board, they have concerns on this. So the maritime dimension had become the number two in the strategic dialogue process. Mm -hmm. Number three is uh, ballistic missile defense system mm -hmm. uh, in which both have been mentioning about this. And uh, although there is no direct cooperation in ballistic missile defense, mm -hmm. both have mm -hmm. uh, uh, perceived uh, common threats, uh, Japan, North Korean missile threat, mm -hmm. Uh, in 1999, when North Korea tested its Taipodong across the Sea of Japan, mm -hmm. the Japanese started uh, considering North Korea as a major challenge. In the case of India, there is the Pakistan uh, factor in, the, in terms of the ballistic <coughs> missile defense. Um, the, the, so the third is in the ballistic missile defense uh, system, mm -hmm. although there is not much concrete progress right. in the strategic dialogue. The fourth one is in the space program. Again, there is not much concrete, but there is probably uh, some discussion will take shape during uh, Prime Minister Abe's mm -hmm. time. So these are four I would suggest mm -hmm. as part of the discussion, economic, technological, uh, maritime, BMD, as well as uh, space cooperation. Right. Talking of the strategic relationship, uh, you know, there is, uh, there is an assessment that uh, India and Japan are getting closer uh, uh, partly because, uh, partly uh, to, to handle the rise of China, you know, partly to deal with the China challenge or perceived threat from China. How much uh, is China a factor in driving India and Japan closer to each other? I think in Dr. Manmohan Singh's speech last year during his Tokyo visit, he had been very explicit about the China factor. Mm -hmm. He said both India and Japan needs to need to bring Japan, uh, China into the mainstream without drastically affecting the regional security situation. Mm -hmm. uh, as China is rising, China needs to be gradually brought in into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Dr. Manmohan Singh mentioned this, indicating that indeed right. China is a factor. But I think we, uh, there has been a lot of attention on the China factor. But I, I think that both India and Japan are coming together because of their own perceived uh, bilateral context rather right, than right. with China as the background. Mm -hmm. China could be one of the factors, but mm -hmm. uh, I think they're coming together mainly from their own bilateral context. Right. 
Right. Uh, for example, as I said, in these four areas, uh, economic, technological, uh, uh, China is not a factor. Right. Uh, uh, indirectly, China is a factor because uh, some 90,000 Japanese companies uh, today have set up shop in, in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and about 800 companies from Japan have set up shop in, in India. Mm -hmm. So huge variation in terms of the attention right. that J Japan pays towards mm -hmm. China. Um, since the labor costs are increasing in China, so Japan now intends to shift some of these manufacturing hubs mm -hmm. into the Indian market, mm -hmm. which means that, of course, there is a China factor, but this is a purely business commercial factor, mm -hmm. which uh, they, uh, they have to factor in. Uh, to what extent anti-Japanese protests in China uh, a contributing factor for the SMEs and right. the, uh, the major industries in Japan to shift over to India, it's, it's not clear. Mm -hmm. In fact, when September 2012 anti-Japanese protests took place in 100 cities in China, um, we have not seen massive shift from Japanese companies in China towards India. So China was not a factor then. Uh, at that point of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, meaning the political aspect is not the factor uh, in Japan's calculation of uh, India. Right. Uh, what they looked at was mainly commercial, whether they can get more profits in the Indian market. Mm -hmm. That was the main consideration rather than the uh, historical issues or whatever. Right. Uh, what about uh, economic uh, relationship between India and Japan? You know, I mean, India and Japan have so much in common in terms of values and shared interests. Uh, but the volume of bilateral trade is just around 18 to 20 billion dollars. Whereas uh, we have many issues with China, but our bilateral trade uh, has now surpassed 70 billion dollars, something in that range. Uh, do you see finally India and Japan economic relationship acquiring the momentum it deserves? I think in terms of the China-India bilateral trade, there is a lot of state uh, attention uh, rather than the market attention. Mm -hmm. um, India has been exporting a lot of iron ore, which now has been curbed with the Supreme Court uh, regulations regarding environmental issues and regional right. issues. Uh, we have also seen uh, that the state-owned enterprises in China have uh, pushed the India trade substantially, as mm -hmm. they have also expanded the other trade with the US, European Union, Japan, and so on and so forth. So there has been, uh, compared to India-Japan trade, there is more of state role in India-China trade. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of India and Japan, it is, it is market-led mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there is also the iron ore export to Japan as mm -hmm. a, one of the largest components of the mm -hmm. uh, trade basket between India and Japan. Uh, yet it, it has more market-related uh, uh, private sector related rather than state guided uh, trade uh, in India Japan relations. So, this is one factor I think we need to uh, look at when we see the volume of trade between right. India China and India Japan. Right. Uh, having said that, I would say India and China have not concluded uh, a free trade area, leave alone a regional trade agreement, while India Japan have concluded a SEPA agreement, mm -hmm. Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which includes even uh, the labor uh, uh, jobs and labor kind of exchanges. Uh, the India-Japan is qualitative, India-Japan trade is qualitatively better compared balance, with yes. India-China in terms of the balance, number one. Number two, in terms of Japanese investments into the Indian market. Mm -hmm. In fact, Japan is the third largest investor in India. While, while China is not, the, uh, it doesn't come up as largest investor in the Indian market. So we see a disjuncture in the India-China, India-Japan kind of uh, trade right. economic relations. Right. Uh, in fact, Japan is planning to invest more than a hundred billion dollars mm -hmm. uh, in the Indian uh, infrastructure, which is what uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh had suggested that right, right. India required one trillion dollars in the infrastructure. Uh, so to that extent, I think Japan is contributing to the economic growth rate in India. Mm -hmm. Uh, with DMIC, Delhi Metro, uh, now possibly an announcement regarding uh, Bangalore to Chennai high-speed railway, mm -hmm. uh, and a host of other freight corridors and, mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. we, uh, we, see, we have seen that China had substantially invested in the infrastructure in India mm -hmm. uh, as compared to China. Uh, of course, China's project investments are pretty high in India, about $51 billion. 
uh, but it is the uh, direct investments which contribute to uh, a quick economic kind of uh, results, profits for India. So in this sector, I think Japan is leading the pack with investments in the Indian market. Secondly, in terms of the manufacturing sector, China has not uh, so far invested in the manufacturing sector in India. Uh, they plan to set up industrial parks, uh, de dedicated industrial parks. Mm -hmm. But Japan already had moved in. In Chennai, there are foundries. Mm -hmm. In other cities as well, there has been uh, a lot of progress so far. Uh, automobile sector, auto parts, mm -hmm. uh, other areas, there has been energy. Uh, there has been substantial progress between India and Japan on the economic aspects. Mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, when uh, Indian Prime Minister may, has to make an assessment, a balance sheet, mm -hmm. uh, he will realize that Japan contributes more to the Indian economic uh, growth rates mm -hmm. rather than China. So looking ahead, uh, how would you describe the future of India-Japan relations? Uh, I think it is, it is uh, substantially, um, uh, it is acquiring a lot of depth uh, with people-to-people uh, -people interaction with uh, cultural exchanges. The uh, Japanese emperor recently visited India, which suggests that there will be uh, uh, tourism promotion uh, will be triggered with this visit because the emperor is revered in the Japanese uh, uh, public. Uh, secondly, the SMEs, small and medium enterprises, will have uh, more outlook towards India. But I would say that there are still problems between Japan and India. Number one is the Kashmir-related issue on which, of course, they have been relatively more silent uh, recently, last decade or so, but they have been siding with Pakistan uh, willy-nilly in major uh, aspects. Uh, secondly, I foresee some trouble between India and Japan in relation to the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the trade balance. Uh, of course, this is being bridged with investments right. in India. Um, I think thirdly, there is also the realization that uh, uh, Japan wants the Indian parliament to pass the labor laws, hire and fire labor laws. Uh, till then, Jap Japanese industrialists do not want to move into the Indian market. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, uh, like what China did in terms of hire and fire, uh, the Japanese industrialists, commercial establishments want the Indian parliament to pass the hire and fire mm -hmm. uh, labor laws. Uh, till then, there will not probably be heavy investments in the Indian market, except in the infrastructure. Right.